Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Through the day, you've heard the perspective from different ministers in the government and, in fact, from the Prime Minister himself. It is time now to hear the perspective from the other side of the ideological and political trenches, and that is the opposition. At a time when we have a government that has been actually voted into power by a definitive and very, very robust majority, where does that leave the opposition? How many dynamics have actually changed post the Bihar defeat for the BJP? And is the opposition being responsible or is it simply being obstructionist by blocking legislation? Is opposition unity going to survive in parliament as the only bulwark against the government? And finally, when the opposition or at least large sections of it keep raising the theme of tolerance, are they being ideologically honest? These are some of the questions before us today, and we have three of our more, most articulate opposition politicians. Let me introduce them, uh, starting with Jyotiraditya Sindhya. He's, of course, the chief whip of the Congress party in the Lok Sabha. Supriya Sule, the most prominent face after her father from the NCP. And Jay Panda of the Biju Janta Dal, who often surprises us with extremely individualistic positions uh, that tend to set the cat among the pigeons. Uh, Jyotiraditya, if I may, if I may start with you, you know, we, one of the big complaints of the Congress when you were in power was that the BJP was blocking legislation for the sake of blocking legislation, and to most ordinary people who are watching what's happening in Parliament today, it's almost as if the BJP and the Congress and the opposition in general have swapped roles. What you, what they used to do to you, you are doing to them. Would you accept that? Barkha, I don't think you've been watching TV. <laughs> because if you watch what's happening in the Lok Sabha over the last 18 months, uh, it's actually been a record of sorts. And I think as a legislator, forget the cap that we are donning, whether we are opposition or government, uh, I think Indian parliament has not seen that track record for a long time. Uh, if you take out the anomaly or the outlier, which was really the monsoon session, in the last three sessions of parliament, parliament has functioned not for 60% or 70% or 80% as some public perception is, but actually 120% of our allocated time. And the fact of the matter is that we have passed almost 47 bills plus the three bills of this session, close to about 50 bills in the last uh, 15 to 18 months. So our role is that of a responsible opposition. We also happen to represent, among the three of us, close to about 24% of the popular vote in this country. And therefore, the role of opposition in parliament is that of one to be a check and balance uh, to policy making as well. And therefore, I believe that debate, discussion, building that across the board, across political parties is, is extremely important before passing a bill. But aren't you taking decisions that are more political than on the merits of the legislation? Let's take the goods and service tax, for example. The Congress was the architect of this legislation. And the impression that one gets is that the Congress has pretty much decided that this is the only political weapon you have right now to exert influence vis-a-vis -vis the government. So you have quite simply not wanted to go into the merits of legislation that you yourself wanted to steer, you simply see it as a point of political influence, as a context for political influence at a time when you have only 44 MPs. Uh, first of all, it's not 44, it's now 45. Uh, Are you all united? But, 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 Are you all united? Sorry. You don't always agree on... The opposition yeah, doesn't okay. always agree on everything. No, we do. I, I think that it's healthy to have a debate intra-party as well. And I think that's what the Congress or other opposition parties here also represent. I think to have that healthy debate, and that's the voice that India needs to hear, whether it's intra-party or inter-party. You must have freedom of expression to be able to voice your views. That's what a robust democracy should represent. And as far as uh, the question that you uh, put to me on with regard to the GST, I possibly, Barakha, couldn't disagree with you more. You're right that we were the architect of the GST bill. Leave aside history, because in many ways that's baggage. Uh, I think many of us uh, love to talk about the past, and I think this current government loves to talk about the past as opposed to heralding in the future, which is what they're responsible for, which is why they've been voted in. But irrespective of the fact that the Congress brought the bill in, and three years it was held up, continuously by the BJP. The fact today is that the GST bill in its current form does not, I believe, 
represent the bill that A, the Congress brought in, and doesn't represent the benefits that should accrue to the nation by a simplification of taxes. And I'll give you three points to make my case. The first is that it is supposed to unify taxes. It's supposed to be a tax on consumption and not on production. However, if you do allow every state to levy a 1% tax, then the advantages of the GST will fall by the wayside. Hmm. And as opposed to an 18 or a 20% cap or whatever, you will have a 28, 30% GST rate adding in what the states are putting in place. It will destroy all the 1.5% Philip to growth that we've been envisaging of uh, at its very uh, uh, essence and its very beginning. The second is with, our, with regard to a dispute resolution mechanism. Yes. Now, Barkha, if you and I tend to to agree or disagree on something, which we more often than not do on our sh your show when you invite us on, then are you and I going to adjudicate on an issue that is an issue of dispute between us? Or should we get a neutral third party? The way this legislation has been put in place is that if Barkha and I have a dispute on an issue, we are going to adjudicate on that issue. But tax policy issue. is the domain of the legislature and the executive, and why no, 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 I'm talking. I'm talking about the Council of States. So if two states have a problem on a particular issue, then that council of states will adjudicate on it. Our mandate is that we must get an independent third party to come and adjudicate on that dispute resolution. So effectively no GST support? We are saying that we want to support GST, but we are saying that there needs to be a dialogue and a conversation which has been lacking for the last 18 months. I'm very happy to note that now the government has understood what it means to work in a democracy. It means building a consensus. It means a dialogue. And I think that beginning has started. It's a good beginning. I do hope through that consensus process, we will reach a conclusion that will benefit the country at large. Okay. I'll come back to, uh, you know, the meeting that took place between Ms. Uh, Mrs. Gandhi and Dr. Manmohan Singh and the Prime Minister. But Jay, if what Yotra Ditya is saying is, is, is in fact correct and the opposition has been reasonably cooperative, why is there this overwhelming impression that the Rajya Sabha is in fact the thorn uh, on the side of this government and you have very very provocatively argued that the Rajya Sabha's power should be reduced to a place where it cannot indefinitely block legislation either that or that the Rajya Sabha should be directly elected and for this you are now facing a privilege notice uh, Varka, thank you for summarizing it so so well because a lot of people that have commented on my op-ed uh, just a week or so ago have only read the headline uh, and haven't really read the article. Now, what I've done in that article is cited three countries, Italy, UK, and the US, which have faced exactly the same problem that we've been facing. Italy has had this logjam for 45 years. Uh, the US solved its problem in 1913, and the UK solved its problem in 1911, where they amended their constitutions so that there is a mechanism to break this deadlock between the upper house and the lower house. They did it in different ways, and you summed it up very well. So my uh, op-ed was to float the idea that the time has come for us to recognize what ought to be the checks and balances? Should you have a complete veto by one house over the other, particularly by an indirectly elected house? So over is that what you think is happening? Well, to be honest, I think it has happened a lot. Not is that entire. happening on the GST according to you? Yes, it is happening on the GST. So you don't no. agree with Mr. Sindhya's position? You know, ironically, let me just t take a step back and point something out. Now, the Biju Janata Dal under Naveen Patnaik's leadership has sometimes uh, uh, supported the government of the government that's there today and sometimes opposed it. And I often get asked in public and by people in the media, why can't you make up your mind? And that's because we stick to ideas consistently, what we have, we have espoused in Odisha and espoused for the country. Now on this, these two issues that Jyotir Aditya was talking about, we happen to agree with him. We think that the 1% cap should go, we, we, uh, the tax should go, and we happen to think that there ought to be a cap, but we don't agree with him and his party. That, it, that the percentage needs to be enshrined in the, in constitution. the constitution. That's a little odd, it's, you know, it's never done. So we are flexible, but you know, our, our support or opposition is based on principle and based on ideas. And you're saying the Congress supported. is not, by implication? Well, sometimes it has, sometimes it hasn't. He's on right this case, that in this case, stop being politically correct, in this case. Let me put it this way. Uh, you know, the Prime Minister having reached out to his predecessor and to Mrs. Gandhi, I think helped in getting parliament to function for the last one week. 
I wish he does more of that. Okay, uh, uh, Supriya, do you agree with Jay? Uh, just quick responses first to his very sort of provocative idea out there that the Rajya Sabha and the way it's structured gives the opposition, even if it's numerically uh, sort of not very consequential compared to the government, an indefinite opportunity to block legislation. And Jay thinks that the rules should change. Jay has a valid point because this has really happened at an extreme level and GST is the real reason all this Pandora's box is opened. But that's the only reason really so much debate is going on right now. I mean, Jay and me both started in parliament through Rajya Sabha. So that's... <laughs> and see, Jay, now if you change the rules, where would... No, I, look, no, we just <laughs> I, I think having served nine years in the Rajya Sabha gives me a perspective of both houses and two terms okay, in the Lok Sabha we'll just now. Let Supriya complete a point, yeah. yeah. So it is just, I think blocking any legislation which is in the interest. I mean, we, like you rightly said, legislation, we were with the Congress at that time together and it's our legislation. I feel we can have good debate. As a matter of fact, the 1% is going to affect one of my, my state the most because we are a manufacturing state. But Maharashtra has been completely, whether it's this regime or early, earlier regime, whoever's in power, our state is very clear. The bureaucracy as well as people in power, whichever whether it's us or them. We all feel we need GST, we can work around this 1% and we are totally committed and our entire systems have been ready for last three years for implementing GST. So we are completely open and we want it to happen. So if something is blocking it like this, which is in the larger interest of the nation, it is an issue. Okay, quick response. Uh, I think we are, we are missing the wood for the trees, Barkha. I don't think uh, any legislation or any issue is blocked or not blocked. It depends upon the government in terms of how much it reaches out to But the make, government, even let, in the last me, session, let, let, you let, remember let me, this, the government said if we are reaching out continuously, the Congress is not meeting us halfway. So therefore, I'd like to correct them in terms of perception over there. Until many recent results came out, there Bihar. was no conversation with the opposition, at least with the Congress party, I can tell you, in the last 15 months. It was very clearly writ that it is either our way or the highway. And a democracy does not function in that manner. And I think now the government has realized that post Bihar, post Jhabwa Ratlam, post yesterday's Gujarat civic uh, uh, poll results. And I think there has been a change. And let me acknowledge that change. Hmm. And I think I do hope that that change does continue. Many times in our business advisory committees, which schedule the business for parliament during the week, when members of Jay's party, uh, and I'm, I'm quoting this, said in that committee that why are you not speaking with us before you bring bills? Why are bills not going to following parliamentary process and going to consultative committees before they're just pushed through parliament? Hmm. The response was, now that you have said this, we will think about it and we will let you know what we think. Why was Rahul that, Gandhi... Why was that Rahul Gandhi is Gandhi not the way parliament functions. But that, let me say that, is now in the past and I do hope that this new trend does continue. Why was Rahul Gandhi not at the meeting called by the Prime Minister with Mrs. Gandhi and Dr. Manmohan Singh on the GST? Did he choose not to go or was he not called? Well, I think that question needs to be answered by the Prime Minister. So he was not called? Mr. Yes, absolutely. It's not true that Rahul Gandhi opposes the GST and the two views within the Congress because he sees it as a political opportunity. The Congress party's stand is very clearly articulated with respect to our issues with the draft of the bill that we had brought out, we are more than happy to have a conversation on it, but the, you, you got to have two hands to clap, right? And that hand has to be extended by government. In the last 16 months it wasn't, now it is, so we are eager to have that conversation. Okay, now uh, one thing that strikes me, you know, listening to the three of you, is whether the opposition has adapted itself enough, and I'll start with you, uh, Jay, and then Supriya, and then Jyotra Ditya, to what is clearly a new kind of politics that has taken shape. Uh, media mediated, you know, whether you take a BJP campaign in 2014, whether you take the Aam Aadmi Party campaign, there's a lot more emphasis on communication than there ever was before. And the other big change is the emphasis on self-made politicians. That is something that the Prime Minister was able to underline it again and again, so was Kejriwal. But in parties that where p political power is seen to be family inherited, this continues to be a question where the new India may not relate to politicians who are no longer self-made. Is that a liability for all three of your parties? I'll start with you. No, I think, I think having a family tradition or a family acceptance by the public can be a tremendous asset. Uh, but you're right, uh, the new India has hundreds of millions of young people 
who grew up in a different India than you and I grew up. We grew up with one television channel, no internet. That's very different today. So I think it's relevant to understand that it is uh, politicians to succeed today must reach out to those hundreds of millions of Indians who can directly be contacted and that interface need not be mediated by anybody. Uh, but having said that, once politicians get elected, now you talked about media playing a role not just in campaigns but in, in, in governance issues because you have debates on TV, in TV studios but not in parliament. And I think we politicians have ceded space that is being grabbed not just by media but for example by an activist judiciary. Hmm. Uh, an activist judiciary is very good but not to the level of micromanaging uh, the kind of micromanaging decisions that you are seeing. But on the, new, on the new versus old politics, you are saying that the impression of dynastic politics isn't really a liability. You are not out of sync with the changing India. Uh, well, I, I think anybody that has a family name to call upon may get an initial advantage. But politics is the ultimate leveler. Naveen Patnaik has not got elected four times uh, just because he's Biju Patnaik's son. He's delivered again and again. Uh, there are others who have not gone past winning once or twice. So I think uh, there is no other test of, uh, of, of merit, as it were, beyond the initial help that somebody might have from a family. But, I, but Supriya, I think my question is, does it appeal to the young Indian of today? You know, when they look at you, I mean, you know, with no, with no dis all three of you are my friends, but people might look at you and say, okay, maybe you're very talented, but there could be somebody else in your party who's more talented. I totally agree with you. As a matter of fact, I would say yes with Jay. What Jay was saying is the first foot in the door is much easier. But at some times, it even, you can just sink into the pressure of having a very large parent who's probably achieved so much. And we've seen that in several fields, that our kids in the same field and have just drowned in it because there's constant comparison. Fortunately, in my case, I feel... You may like being the Abhishek Bachchan to the Amitabh Bachchan. That's not what I said. <laughs> That's not what I said. No, but it's but kind of like that, that. That comparison is a burden to carry. I mean, it's a, it's a but it's not necessary. difficult standard to live up I, to. That's, that's what not I mean. true. I have a exceptionally hard working. Everybody thinks he's harder, works harder than me, is better than me, which he is. So you just go with the flow. You don't have to get into the pressure. And why do you have to aspire to be exactly? You can be good qualities. And you have your own dreams and aspirations. Why do they have to be identical? So I think you live in space, but I do agree with your point that today people prefer self-made people, whichever field it is. And I think it's right. Why not? Why should somebody be more privileged than you are? And today privilege is almost a bad a, word. It's, it is a bad word. Yeah. It, I think that's, that. that's a very interesting and thought. And it's reality. And, and, and uh, Jyotri Ditya, this actually plagues your party more than any other party because Mr. Modi was able to, for example, keep saying Shehzada, Shehzada to mock Rahul Gandhi in the campaign. And I've asked you this at least three times before and I'm going to ask you a fourth time. Why can't you be a prime ministerial candidate for the Congress party in 2009? Why does it have to be Rahul Gandhi? Okay, so let me try and answer both your questions. <laughs> There's the just one part, question. I, I, think, I think it's very healthy for India. The very fact that whether it's media, social media, activists, I don't think we need to decry any segment of that because that's what makes us or makes us so vigilant uh, and I remember when I was in business school I uh, had the, the, the uh, I was fortunate enough to, talk, uh, to be taught by Andy Grove who's the founder of Intel and he, he told us four words uh, uh, before the last, the last lecture and he said remember guys whatever you guys do in life there's one thing I just want to leave you with and that's only the paranoid survive <laughs> right? So it's, it's our turn as politicians to be paranoid. We've got to watch what Barkha is saying about us on TV every day. We've got to watch about what other people are saying. And then that's a good thing because that wakes you up in the morning and makes you want to keep going and thinking of new things to do. Why is it that the political class is decried upon if you choose the vocation for myself personally, not of politics, but of public service. If a lawyer's daughter or son wants to become a lawyer, that's not privilege. If a uh, accountant's daughter or lawyer or doctor's lawyer, uh, uh, daughter or son wants to become a doctor, that's not privilege. But for a politician's son or daughter who may, may not as well, but may have their right heart in the right place and want to do good 
for their area, forget the country because that's too ambitious, but at least for their area, their parliamentary area. That's privilege and that's a crime? Is it a crime for me to be born as my father's son? And at the end of the day, if any of us, whether it is Jay, Supriya, me, or any of us, have gone through the iron test of an electoral battle where you don't have one, two, or three opponents, you have 25 opponents. It's the richest democracy. And you win through that electoral battle, and this last election has shown for those dynasts that have won, there are so many who haven't. And that's the beauty of Indian democracy. But you haven't answered my question. So, I'm going to come to that. <laughs> Why is the top job in I'm, your party reserved? It's not. It is reserved. So let me answer that. Okay, so having said that on that front, the, any political party has a robust electoral process. The Congress party has an electoral process that goes down to the panchayat level. It is through that electoral process that we, as workers or party members, choose a certain person to lead the party. You may say that is a right choice or a wrong choice, but it is a choice of a collective. And that is a choice that one must respect. And at the end of the day, it's the people who decide wh what is the leadership that they want to choose at the national level. But isn't it true that there have been leaders, as Supriya smiling there, like if you think of Sharat Pawar and his split from the Congress, it was widely seen to be because he had ambitions of his own. And ambition, but let me say, and ambition but, to reach beyond the, beyond but, the Gandhi but, family but, is not encouraged no, in the but Congress. Let me say, but let me say, what is wrong with that? You had today uh, on the podium, Barkha, with you, Akhilesh Yadav, who very clearly stated his father's ambition of being Prime Minister of India. What is wrong with that? I think that's all very healthy for a democracy. And you and I may agree to disagree, and you may decide to chart your own path, and that's fine. I must have the greatest respect for you. There's nothing wrong with that. That's the beauty of Indian democracy. There is no stamping out of, of a different uh, think, way of thinking. There's liberty of thought, freedom of speech and expression, which we must protect, which is the debate that we've had in Parliament over the last four days. No, and I'm going to come to that debate, but I think the point I was making was whether this is an old-style politics that is being challenged it's not, today. It's and not an old-style politics, you? because, because Barkha, please remember, in our country, we want people who are committed to growth of our country. We don't care whether they come from a legal fraternity, from a political family, from X or Y. But the key test for us is that they must not have their head only in the right I'm place. Just they must have their heart in the right place as well. Supriya? I mean, speaking to your father's experience and the history of the split with the Congress, but you, I did see you agreeing with me, saying that this is an old way of politics, and it's under challenge today in today's I come India. I from a very modern state, which is very vocal, and of course, with the media that we watch every day, I mean, I think the worst thing that you can do to yourself today is everything that is going wrong in this country is because of the politicians, and whatever happening good is God and good <laughs> luck and civil society and so on. So, but I would agree with you because this is the feedback we get when we are with people. Hmm. We see that in our party cadre as well. And it's quite, I mean, it's widely discussed in our party. And the biggest TRP that they even sell of my father, who is the leader of the party, is he started from nothing, has always been, call it bratty, you call it a young Turk, whatever, because he's always challenged various leadership because he's had differences, including his own mentor, which is, he's been very public and vocal exactly. about. He's paid a price in his career for it. Several times there have been setbacks, but he's lived his life on his, his own terms, which is, I think, wonderful in his case. But today... Give us I an example of a price he's paid for it. Oh, so many times he's been removed as the chief minister in 1979, when he had differences. He formed, he were left out of the Congress. So the, there are several examples. And, I mean, he's had a great time in his life. But anyway, we're not talking about him right now. So, no, as, as an example of what you Yeah, saying. but so he has done it. I mean, he has yeah. had issues several times. But the point is, I think, what, what you see from the common man today, or when, I, when you go to colleges, you meet younger people, they definitely want all of us to come really from the roots. And I respect that. There's nothing wrong in it. And what even Jyotir said is true. A lot of our friends who do come from families like all three of us come, have lost this time. So it's not a guarantee that just because you're born and gone are those days where we think that just because we have a brand, we are always going to be in, win an election. That's not going to happen. No, I, and it's not even about you individually. I was making the point that people don't react well, uh, Jyotir Ditya, to a party where they think that the top job is blocked even though you or a Sachin Pilot or a Milan Diora may be the better candidate. Anybody. I mean, it could be anybody, right? But they could be people who are more effective, but they don't get to... You know, it's like being in a company where there's a glass ceiling. 
I don't agree with you. I think in the fact that in 12 or 13 years, many of us who have just entered politics have had opportunities to be able to uh, work towards building the nation as junior ministers or uh, uh, whatever capacities we've had as some of us as general secretaries and so on and so forth. And I think there has something to be said for experience as well. And as far as a glass ceiling, as far as the top is concerned, let's not forget that for 10 years you had a non-Gandhi as a prime minister. You've had before that, Narsimha Rao as a Prime Minister, you've had President of the party being Sitaram Kesri. So I don't agree with that notion at all. But I do think that at the end of the day, a party has to choose what the party thinks is the most, uh, the best candidate for that post. And that is what the Congress party's internal elections have very clearly shown. Okay, I want to just move on to something that we've heard a lot of in Parliament this week, tolerance the tolerance debate. Uh, Jay, which seems to have got so politically polarized that it's become almost impossible to have a kind of balanced conversation about it. So for example, you have the BJP calling those returning awards intellectual mercenaries. You have a Congress leader who's comparing the award va Vapsi to Mahatma Gandhi returning his award after Jallianwala Bagh. So there's complete uh, sort of hyperbolic overstatement on both sides or would you say that there is in fact a toxic environment today and that it, it needs to give us all pause? So I'd like to say four things very quickly. Number one, unequivocally, I condemn and we must all condemn when we see horrific incidents like the murder of that man in Dadri, or you see um, rationalists being killed for their views. Unequivocally, we must condemn that, okay? I also don't believe that we should try to divert attention from any of these issues by saying, what about when that such and such happened earlier? Uh, the incidents that happened earlier need to be condemned equally. And only if somebody has a consistent track record of avoiding one side of incidents and only pointing, or pointing the figure out at another side of incidents, should you then make the point that there is intellectual dishonesty. I have something more to say about this. The other thing is, when people are returning awards or claiming that India is intolerant, uh, we must give them a hearing and respond to them and communicate that that's not so. And not if, run them down as politically if, motivated. If we don't, because you know, it's not that India suddenly became intolerant today. We have had incidents like this throughout our modern history. And that needs to be communicated and instead of attacking those who attack the idea of a tolerant India today. And let me give you just one instance today. You mentioned a little bit earlier that a privilege motion has been moved against me today in the Rajya Sabha uh, about that article that I've written that mooting the idea that other countries have reformed their upper houses should we consider some of these models. Six Rajya Sabha MPs have apparently find, filed a privilege motion against me. And these six have been at the forefront of screaming that India is intolerant today. And they can't tolerate an op-ed citing new ideas. Let, let me get the others to respond to this privilege. Like, do you, do you agree with this privilege notice? Do you agree with Jay that it undermines the whole position that many of these MPs, do you want to name them quickly? Well, I, I haven't got a confirmation and but I'll apologize if I'm wrong. I understand that the privilege motion against me is moved by Derek O'Brien, KC Tyagi, Mosina Kidwai, T. Raja and a few others. Okay, so quick, quick, quick responses from Supriya and Jyotiraditya to this, yeah. Well, I think that uh, uh, every citizen, why a member of parliament, but every citizen has a right to express his or her views. And I think that uh, if Jay has done so, that is his constitutional right. We may agree or disagree between the two of us, but I think if anyone is trying to throttle a member of parliament or any citizen of this country from expressing their views, I think that's completely wrong. With regard to the debate on intolerance, Barkha, I'd like to make a very key point. There is a differentiator here. You talked about, and Jay talked about, the what about tree that's going yeah. on. You've done X, Y happened 10 years ago. That's not the issue. I agree with him that the, the what about tree has to stop. But the key issue here is that never before have you had responsible members of a political party, including members of parliament and ministers, making completely racial and irresponsible statements and there being no control on those statements by the government. And I don't want to even list those statements out, but there have been ministers that have used words, Ram Zado versus something else, which I can't even mention. 
I mean, it is despicable, and there is no sign of any control from the central government. The prime minister himself talks on the Dadri issue after 10 to 15 days. He says that it's a, it's a state issue. At the end of the day, the prime minister is responsible for the lives and security of the people of this country. And if members of his party are going to make incestuous comments going over there, such as Hindustan is for Hindus and Muslims can go to some other country, hmm. chief ministers making those statements, general secretaries of the party saying Shah Rukh Khan can go off to Pakistan, someone else, a member of parliament of the BJP saying he's like Hafiz Saeed, you're going to stoke that environment. And it's important that you put a cap on it immediately, which was never done. So the environment is being created to allow these elements to rear themselves. And that is the key issue around which we debate. Brief interjection. Yes, would you, would you accept that what's different today, because you just had a sentence, India has always seen shades of intolerance. His argument is that never before have you seen actually ministers of the union cabinet being able to make the kind of comments. Jama. General V.K. Singh, he, he gives us one example. We've seen Mahesh Sharma calling and, and, Dadri and an Bhakram, accident. Sorry to I think, interrupt you, Jay, if I may. Apparently today, and I, again, I stand to be corrected and let me apologize if what I'm saying is incorrect, but apparently he's made some statement today uh, referring to yesterday's goings on in parliament that kuch aise neta hain jo chuhe billi ki tuch soch aur vichhar dhara hamare Rajya Sabha mein rakhte hain. This is his statement is he about, talking about, General Vikas Singh? about members of parliament in the Rajya Sabha. Look. Uh, again, let me reiterate, uh, we must condemn any such uh, statements that are made by whether they're fringe elements or whether they're cabinet ministers, and it, they're not unique to any one party. Every party has them, I, you know. Give certainly. examples from other parties? Well, there have been cabinet ministers and chief minister level people that have made very, very derogatory remarks about women in previous governments. I don't want to go into, into details of that. My point is, we must condemn them. Now, whether the Prime Minister has spoken out soon enough or, you know, enough about it or not, that I, people should discuss, but I have... Do you think he's spoken out enough about it? He has spoken it? out repeatedly in Parliament and outside. On several Dadri? Times, several times. On Dadri? Well, when, remember when about eight months ago we used to have a spate of reports of church attacks? And there were reports that the Prime Minister was not speaking out. But he did, in fact, speak out in Parliament and outside of Parliament. But, you know, you, we can argue about whether he's done enough, whether he's spoken out enough, whether he's taken action against some of these fringe elements or Are not. Are there ministers and in the right. government you believe have abused the office of a minister, subverted the Constitution, and should no longer be in the Cabinet? I'm not sure that people have subverted the Constitution. I'll have to look at that. But certainly, some members have made rather astonishing remarks that they ought to be uh, made to face up. But I'm hearing from you that you think the Prime Minister has done, done enough to check them. Well, I'm, look, I'll leave that to people to decide. I'm just saying that you can argue about whether he's spoken out often enough and uh, soon enough and things like that. But that he's not spoken out is not accurate. Quick, quick response, but, Supriya. Jay, I'll tell you one thing, which I think the government, when they started the intolerance debate, the first thing Rajanath Singh Ji said, was if you tumko aapko logo ko sujaav dene ho to sujaav bhi dijiye and the only sujaav i gave him in my speech was please tell your people not to talk out of turn and out of context and in his defense a lot of us did say that in various during the discussion and the first thing that venkaya ji did after the debate was there was a gag order against him so they did realize that there was i mean they may not say it in public but they do admit that what was done was wrong and the fact that there was a gag order means we were all right that they were all out of turn. They may not have taken a stand to protect their own people, to sack them, to prove hmm. a point, but they definitely do realize it was a blunder because they won't give in to an indulgence debate so easily. So I think nobody can dispute that. that it was but, not uh, 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 we actually saw members of parliament trying to block General V.K. Singh from functioning in, in, in the House yesterday. Do you think that that is, uh, also, that is constitutional? Well, I think if you have made such a derogatory statement, to bring that to light and to make you accountable. Our children are out of line. They do something wrong. If the mother or father or a senior member of the family does not correct them, then who will? And that is a similar analogy with the way you run this country or this government. At the end of the day, you are supposed to be the father figure or the mother figure. And, and where do you think he's failed? I think that if this had been reined in 15 months ago when this whole saga started, I think a lot of the damage that has accrued to the BJP would have stopped right there. 
and if that had happened then you would have not seen this cascading effect one of the charges uh, jyotiraditya against uh, some of your parties is of hypocrisy and it's not about what about tree but it's about selective outrage that's sometimes the feedback that you get so you know some people say about the congress that your record on tolerance is not very good that when you talk about the kalburgi assassination it happened in the in a congress run state when you talk about narendra dabolkar the rationalist it happened in a congress ncp state even before the bjp was at the center look at satanic verses you had one of your your former finance minister speak up last week saying it should never have been banned not one member of your party was willing to support him so is there a selectiveness in the positions we take on tolerance i think that what i believe in and i believe in emphatically anyone anywhere if an incident is wrong whether he belongs to my party the bjp supriya's party jay's party you've got to and that's our accountability as politicians i certainly believe it was our mistake and it takes a lot of courage to say that yes it was in our during our regime and it was wrong we could not protect him it's a failure of our government I would so you take responsibility oh, for that. Absolutely, we take responsibility. There's no doubt. And two wrongs. And that's really good to hear without ifs absolutely. and buts. Absolutely, it's, it's yeah. on record. He was there when I spoke in Parliament. So two wrongs don't make a right. Two rights don't make a wrong. You know, it's it's as simple as that. It's you can't just use double cover versus pancer. Your government versus mine. Come on. And I think but that. Two. And I think that's what people of this country are looking forward to. There's enough of this two two me me. आपने ये किया आप कौन होते हैं कहने के लिए आपके जमाने में ये किया अरे भाई किसके भी जमाने में हो जो गलत है सो गलत है जो सही है जो सही है यार साफ साफ क्यों नहीं हम लोग कह दें वट हैपन्ड इन इमरजेंसी इज रॉन्ग लेट्स लेट्स नॉट गो बैक एंड फॉर्थ ऑन इट वट हैपन विद सीक राइट इज रॉन्ग अरे एनी लॉस ऑफ लाइफ इन दिस कंट्री इ रिस्पेक्टिव विच गवर्नमेंट इज इन पावर वी नीड टू कम आउट एंड से वॉट इज राइट इज राइट एंड वॉट इज रॉन्ग बट यू नो दिस इज द फर्स्ट टाइम दट वीर हेरिंग एन अनकालीफाइड पोजिशन फ्रॉम अ कांग्रेस लीडर ऑन द इमरजेंसी ऑल ऑफ लास्ट वीक ऑल ऑफ लास्ट वीक इट इज द फर्स्ट टाइम एंड आई अपलॉड यू फॉर दैट because all of last week if you watch the parliamentary debate when mr jetley raised the issue of emergency and he said that that was the biggest violation of the constitution you had so many ifs and buts from congress leaders who are hesitant to criticize indira gandhi i am glad to hear you say it and i'd ask you to elaborate on the emergency you never asked me now i'm asking you never asked me before i'm asking you now well i certainly think that at that point of time in that period of history irrespective Of what the environment was, and one has to look at it contextually. But I think at the end of the day, if you hail our country to be the world's largest democracy, you've got to stand up for those democratic values. And I and I go back to the statement that I started this debate with: that any action that throttles freedom of speech and expression is something that we cannot, as Indian citizens, be proud of. So, emergency was a blot on the Congress record. I think emergency was a mistake for our country. Period. Whether you talk about it as a Congress person or anyone else. Okay, Jay. Quickly, I want to move on to no, something else. No, I was I was just that. going to clarify about the what about re and the hypocrisy because uh, it's not correct if you use what about re to divert attention from a current outrage. Yeah. But if somebody has a consistent track record of being hypocritical, of being of selective outrage, then it is perfectly all right to call them on it. Okay. Uh, just before we take questions, uh, quick comments on what has become a, a a kind of slogan in our politics that there are many different views on, and that is suit boot ki sarkar. Now, when the suit boot ki sarkar slogan was first used by Rahul in Parliament, it was kind of instant hate. It was like that Hindi film punchline. But has its effect sustained? Because when I think of you know, obviously the implication Jyotir Aditya was that this is a government that's for is catering to the rich, right? But there was also a Dr. Ambedkar who always wore a suit. So, what did you mean by the suit boot ki sarkar exactly? And is this a slogan that has resonance in New India? so i think it was a, a metaphor and i think that's very clear it was a metaphor that at the end of the day our country is made up of 65% of employment opportunities that accrue from the agrarian sector uh, there are still disadvantaged people that need a, a their rightful opportunity and in the last 18 months we have seen no signs of that agrarian growth has gone from 4.4% to negative 1.1% uh budget allocations for health education which go down to the panchayat level have been slashed across the board so very clearly this government's notion of saying that it's only through uh, catering to a select group of people will you see the panacea of development in this country and that truly is not the case 
please understand that what is the environment you're operating in. You have gone from $120 a barrel of oil prices to $45 a barrel of oil prices. That's given you tailwinds to our economy of almost $16 billion a year. Hmm. And with that in place, you are still cutting down budgetary outlays on social sectors, on ICDS, issues of women empowerment, child malnutrition, which is something that Supriya and I are very passionate about, which needs to be tackled. You cannot have islands of prosperity in this country. You have to have oceans of prosperity. So the and that can only happen when you, when you pursue a twin agenda of, econ it's not one without the other, economic growth along with social equity and that growth percolating down to the grassroots. So the point was metaphorical and not the Prime Minister's suit. Yes. But that, but that, that aside, that was a different point, but you're right, it was metaphorical. Nothing to do but with the Prime the Minister's suit was also a point, was which also then got auctioned for four and a half crores. And the point was? And the point was the very fact that if you're going to wear a suit with, you know, uh, your name emblazoned on it, and then you're going to auction it for four and a half crores, when actually you need to cater to the agrarian area, to cater to suicides that are happening, development that needs to be happening, that is something that you must address. Okay, quick last comments on the Sood Burki Sarkar, then we open up the floor. Jay and Supriya. Look, uh, the Sood Burki Sarkar, of course, I think is a continuation of an earlier argument uh, that there is a difference between a Bharat and an India. And I think the idea is to try and put this government in a slot that you are pro-corporate interest and against farmers and against the average Indian. And you know, that's a legitimate political tactic. I don't begrudge them for that, but I don't agree with it. It's not that... Uh, uh, that India is so small that you only have to cater to any one side of India. You have to look after farmers' interests, you have to find them ways of getting more employment outside of farms because the farms are not catering to the uh, more than 50% of Indians that live on them. But that doesn't mean you neglect investors or you neglect industry because if you do that, we certainly cannot create those jobs. So I think that's a false so dichotomy. So you don't think it's a suit would ki sir? I think it's a false dichotomy. Uh, whether it is a Sudbut ka sarkar, let me uh, quote to you a book that I'm reading now, which is T. N. Nainan's book called uh, The Turn of the Tortoise. And everybody would accept he's sort of a neutral figure. And he says that if, if you make an allegation that this government is beholden to corporate interests, you could make a bigger allegation along the same lines of its predecessor. Let me, let me give the last word to Supriya and we'll take questions. If you have questions, please raise your hand. I yeah. just think it was in a flow of a speech to make an identity of a person. I don't think. And I think every government, while we all work, we see it's really from, we have to cater to everything. We're, we represent, like all three of us, about 18 lakh people, 1.8 million people. And there is a spectrum of people in it. So it's just not one thing. Well, there are failures of every government and there are success stories. And I am a bit like Jay, I must say, I am not ashamed to say, because I come from such a modern developed state, that you have friends in corporates and you only have to be friendly with the poor. I think you can have a spectrum of friends, spectrum of relationships and policies for all, which will build an India where everybody becomes equal and there's equal opportunity of skill and why should everybody not have enough money? Why can't everybody have a better life? So why is wealth creation looked at as like a taboo? I think that's the point is really bad. I think that's a good point and I'll allow you a 15 second closer on that as you, uh, I scout for questions that this is a false dichotomy and that wealth is not a bad word and why has the Congress started treating corporate and wealth as a bad word and, and what's wrong with the suit? But wealth is certainly not a bad word. <laughs> wealth is certainly not a bad word. The very fact that if you look at the maximum wealth creators today, and a case in point for you is the genesis of Infosys. They started with a corpus of 50,000 rupees, three people sitting together in one room. And today that's a $15 billion company. That's India's strength. The entrepreneurial capability of our people is, is India's strength. The point that we are trying to make is you've got to be able to unleash that power which India has been able to unleash since Manmohan Singh Ji's liberalization in 1991. But you've got to also concentrate on the social sector, on the agrarian side, on the disadvantage, to allow them that opportunity as well. It is not an either-or story. It is an and story. India cannot succeed without India's entrepreneurial talent, as well as making sure that we give the maximum opportunities to those that need it the most. It has got to be a culmination of both those strengths. Okay, let's open the floor. Uh, if you have questions, please raise your hand. Uh, 
at the back there. If you could stand up, it'll help us get the mic to you here at the third table. Yeah, please stand up. Can we just get the mic? Yeah. Question is to uh, Supriya Sule. My name is Sandeep Chandra. You see, this uh, gag order on the ruling party's MPs, I think just lip service. There is a very sinister thing, uh, kind of thing going on. Uh, I think we all have forgotten, not very long ago, uh, our president died, our former president APJ Abdul Kalam. And then you had this minister saying that even though he was a Muslim, he was a patriotic Indian. And then, you know, uh, you go and allot Abdul Kalam's house to him. But that's a question for the BJP to answer, right? No, no, well, I'm, I'm just talking about intolerance and tolerance. So, uh, you know, this, uh, this gag order thing was brought up by you. But, uh, you know, is this gag order thing working? Okay, quick, quick response to you. You said that it Well, it just happened 48 hours ago. So far, so good. So let's hope they continue it. But ga see, intolerance is not about a gag order. Intolerance is what you have to feel within also. None of us, we are very modern, liberated people who have seen the world, have been exposed. And I think basic Indian, my, I have an objection with the word tolerance. We don't tolerate each other. We are happy to be together. Mm. So why should it be intolerance? It brings in negativity. I have objection to the word itself. I think that's a good. We don't tolerate each yeah, other. Yeah, tolerance we itself is such a yeah, it's such a word. negative word. Absolutely. Uh, questions? Questions? Yes, uh, here in the front row. Can we get her a mic, please? Yeah, um, I think Mr. S I, this is a just a comment to Mr. Sindhya. He had uh, mentioned all the other professions except the film industry, which uh, he had missed. Now, coming to the intolerance bit, uh, uh, with due respect to the Prime Minister, he, on the, on the uh, dais once, he mentioned the three idiots, which was not, uh, uh, he uh, addressed the three, the, the, the three party. Um, What's your question, ma'am? The question, uh, no, we were talking about intolerance. And every time the issue of Mrs. Sonia Gandhi being the Motka Sodagar, which they were saying that, you know, we revert back to what was said then, and so we say that. What, what's the question? No, uh, why didn't these three parties object to that statement of being called idiots? Well, I think the people of Bihar gave a fitting response to that statement. <laughs> Okay. No, no, it was not addressed to please, the people. If of you Bihar. have a co please uh, raise your hand only if you have a question and not a comment. It has to be a question, and you have to say who the question is for. It can't be this open-ended uh, kind of comment. Yes, here, please, please stand up. Uh, third table. Yes. So my name is Nina Chatrath, and it's nice to hear you all speaking. But you know, it would be really nice. You know, all of us belong to the corporate India. You know, you have a topic called the challenges before us. How about giving us some macro issues around that? How about as people belonging to different parties, representing different states, can we have the macro picture? Can we hear something? And I hate to say this, Prime Minister gave us a very, very interesting speech. And he really did address a lot of macro issues. Hoping to hear that from you too. Yes. You know, if we start listing the challenges before India, it'll take a whole another session. Yeah, and we have, because only we have a lot minutes, of it. So, yeah. so all I'm going to say is, if my, my top challenge today for India today is jobs. Because I heard an anecdote the other day about a state government advertising posts for five peons. <laughs> you required to be eighth standard pass. And they had 25,000 applications, including 150 PhDs. That is the biggest challenge before this country. And we cannot create those jobs unless we just get done with this tutu meme in parliament and get things like GST done and many other such bills. I think I would definitely second what Jay says because I have the same problem. If I go to my constituency and when I meet people, if I meet 100 people, 90 are asking me for jobs and all are qualified. So I would second that. But another biggest challenge which I feel we really need to together address as a society and a world is water. Because unless we have enough water, none of these programs that we really wish to address, whether it's industry, whether it's healthcare, whatever it is, water is a basic necessity, groundwater, agrarian crisis, all connected to water. So I think for me, the biggest challenge I feel in India and globally is water, and we would definitely like to make. And like what Jai said, there are many challenges we can't put in because we only have four minutes, and I would like to give him <laughs> some time as well. So I think we talked about jobs, right? Uh, 
how do you create those jobs? I think India has a tremendous opportunity. So if you want, uh, if I had an opportunity to give you two ideas or three ideas. The first idea, we're the world's largest producer of milk. We're the world's second largest producer of fruit and vegetables at 150 million tons. Th world's third largest producer of food grain at 220 million tons. How much do we process of it? Nothing. 20%. Wastage, 45%. Huge opportunity of a logistical chain there to make sure that you move farmers from agrarian to manufacturing and food processing. And that transition has to take place because you cannot have this dichotomy in India that 65% of your employment opportunities are restricted to contribution of 15% of GDP. So that transition has to take place, number one. Second idea, how do you create opportunities for jobs? Tourism. Look at the ratio of direct to indirect jobs in the area of tourism, it's one is to nine. How many tourist arrivals in India? Pitiful, four million. We have a huge treasure house to show the world. Third issue I would say in addition to water which we need to tackle is pollution. Across cities across this country, if you cannot make this country, the cities, states livable for our kids, 70% of kids in Delhi today have respiratory problems. We need to tackle that issue. And finally, I would say, most importantly, women's empowerment. Today, you have 50% of our population whose capability we are not harnessing. Christine Lagarde had said in one of her IMF speeches that if you actually put the ratio of men to women equally in jobs, USA's GDP will increase by 5%. 9% in Japan, do you know how much in India? 27%. That's the latent opportunity that stands before us. And you've got to make sure that we get our main women into the mainstream to be able to contribute to the national growth. Okay, last question here in the green. Last question. Last question here, yes. Yes? Uh, I'll, okay, two, we'll take two quick questions. Ma'am, why don't you start first? Yeah, please, please, please. Quickly, we, I'm, I'm down, I'm on the clock this now. This question is to Mr. Jay Panda. He just mentioned about the fact that uh, we need jobs. Now, that is one aspect which the Prime Minister had promised in his speech last year. Now, when you mentioned about uh, jobs, is it not a fact that the main problem is the population, which especially in the northern states is uncontrollable? Nobody mentioned throughout this afternoon and in the morning hours also a word about the population that is eating up the infrastructure. And that is a very tragic situation because I, having come from Bihar, know that it's a very populated state where if there is no control over the population, no other infrastructure will fit into that. So will you have a question, answer for that, Mr. Panda? Uh, the population can be seen as a problem. It can also be seen as an opportunity. Absolutely. Because India's population is what is <laughs> providing this huge market uh, that the rest of the world is looking at. It's only a problem if we can't provide them the education, if we can't provide them the access to opportunities. And many southern states have proved that we can, despite having large populations. And stabilizing populations by force is not the answer. As you've seen, China has just reversed mm. its 30-year-old policy. The way to stabilize population is not by policies, but by encouraging the girl child's education, by encouraging economic opportunities. Now, we have many laws in the country which disincentivize jobs. We have labor laws, which there are so many industrialists in this hall, they will confirm. They go, they bend over backwards, they go out of their way so as not to create jobs to make capital intensive investments because it is such a hassle to deal with the government regulations. We need to change some of these laws. Okay. You want to quickly yeah, very quickly. I, I think uh, I agree with Jay, but I would like to add a little bit of a caveat. Education is not the panacea. Look at the number of young people in our country today who have degrees but can't get jobs. Yeah. What is extremely important in addition to education is vocational training. You've got to be able to provide that vocational training storehouse so that people can get opportunities across various services. And I think that is an area we need to concentrate. And in my own parliamentary constituency, along with CSR and, and ILFS, with Gail, we've actually set up one of these vocational training schools where I put in only one rule and one condition, that I don't want a, a polytechnic where you take 
Supriya, me in, give us some skills and then say, hey guys, you know what, find your own job. I want an end-to-end -end solution, which means that the person must get their first job at the end of that training period. And if you're able to provide that end-to-end -end value chain, I think you will provide opportunities to our young people across the length and breadth of our country. Okay, two, two last questions here in the green. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah, Thank you, Jyoti Ditya, for um, the wonderful suggestions you gave. You, we had last 10 years to actually work on those suggestions, and some of them are being worked at from the, by the current government. My question right now, straight to all three of you, are very responsible parliamentarians representing three extremely important parties in the parliament is, what can you do in the next three to four years, which are left till 2019, to support this government that actually development and governance becomes the main, more, most important priority for the government and not get diverted into other debates like intolerance, etc. Please, we need your support right now and really want an answer for this. Thank you. Start with you. Yeah. So let me thank you for your comment and let me also say this, that let's not forget that the transformation that India has gone through today is not because India has experienced 9% or 10% or today's growth rate of 5.2% on the old data, which is 7.4%, right? It's because India has experienced a decadal growth rate of close to 6.5%. That is what has transformed India over 20 years, from 1991 to 2004 and from 2004 to 2015. That 6.5% compounding is the magic that the USA went through for 100 years at 3%, which has made it a world power. So we've got to concentrate on the power of compounding, which the UPA government gave this country in the 10 years that we were in power. That being said, it is our job as legislators in parliament to make sure that we pass progressive bills that are in the interests of our nation. And as I've said already, in the last three sessions, we have passed almost 47 bills. However, it is also incumbent and respon the responsibility of the current government and its leadership to make sure that those bills are then executed into policy making, which will translate in opportunities for our people. That is the responsibility of government. And we are there to support government when it brings progressive bills, but we are also there as an opposition to make sure that we are the check and balance in democracy when negative connotations come in, which will not benefit the people of our country. I think I get what you're coming, where you're coming from. What you're saying is be a constructive opposition where required, but make sure no reforms are stopped. I completely agree with you. And as a matter of fact, on a lighter note, a lot of times because we are so pro-reform, we're sort of a lot of people and our old friends think we're tilting with, towards the new regime because we're supporting <laughs> a lot of their reforms. But we are a progressive And party. you're not tilting towards the new regime? No, not. We are not. The point is what you do you in the interest of the, the nation. You won't replace the Sena in Maharashtra as an alliance partner. No, no, that's not the point. I think no, no, but I'm just it. seizing the opportunity to slip in a question. No, no, not at all. Look, <laughs> marriages go through ups and downs. So did ours. <laughs> and so is theirs now. So let's not go there. Okay. I think what she's saying is about the larger picture that people are very anxious. I saw even the Prime Minister's various global visits. The first question he's asked is, what are you doing about GST? So I know where he's coming from and I do understand because even if we represent a spectrum of people, we do have industry in our constituencies as well or on various forums like this. So we do understand the need of reforms and I agree with you that we really need to bring in the change to pass reforms. We can have our differences, but at one level, the country's development should not stop because of our political differences. I'm with you in that. Yeah. So the, the, question was, the question was, as opposition parties, what can we do to help the government? Yeah. I think it's been touched upon in some ways. We have to play the role of a responsible opposition to ensure that we hold the government's feet to the fire and get them to pass better laws. Now, checks and balances is what the role of the opposition is, but not to the point of stopping the passage of all bills. Now, we've passed a lot of bills, as Jyotiraditya said, but mostly smaller bills. Some of the big bills like GST, which is crucial, has been held up for far too long. So I'd like to say one last thing. Last thing is, the perfect can sometimes be the enemy of the good. We should accept the idea of a parliamentary democracy is to find a, the least bad alternative, a compromise which suits everybody. So my advice and request <laughs> to my friend Jyoti Raditya is, we support you 
on the capping of the of the rate of GST. Just don't insist on making it a constitutional amendment. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to take 20 seconds to just ask all three of you, since you've said you're ready to be a constructive opposition and every government must be doing something right, to ask all of you to name who you think is the best performing minister in this government. And I'll start with you. <laughs> be bipartisan. Quickly, before we end, and I've literally, time's up, the monitor's no, there, telling me. There are, there are several very... Name, name, uh, name, name, name one. Uh, Suresh Prabhu, Arun Jaitley, Piyush Goel, I mean, I can go on. There are several very good performing. For me, it's uh, Nitin Gadkari, Arun Jaitley, and our real minister, Suresh Prabhu. Mr. Sindhya? Well, I think there are many, but I, if you ask me to name, then certainly uh, Suresh Prabhu comes to mind. All right, so many voices for Suresh Prabhu and uh, evidence that our opposition can be bipartisan and objective when needed. Let's have a big round of applause for our panel, please. Thank you.